Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for what I know will be an educational and informative evening of conversation with our mayoral candidates regarding their vision and commitment to issues of critical importance to our arts and culture community. Before we begin, let me remind everyone that tonight's session, let me tell everyone that tonight's session is being taped by the Woodruff Center and by Public Broadcasting Atlanta. Many thanks to the Woodruff Center and to PBA for their support this evening. Candidates, I know that you all have had a busy, busy day and busy several weeks. For those of you in the audience who have not yet heard, uh, this is not only the 37th forum, 37th, yes, that's what I said, forum that this group has participated in this season, but this is the third forum today. So if you see just a little less sparkle in their eyes, please don't think that it's anything other than sheer exhaustion at the uh, effort that they have made to make sure that their messages are communicated very broadly across this great city of ours. And I know that at this stage in the game, they really need no introduction, but since we're taping and filming this for posterity, uh, let me introduce them to the audience at large. First, and to my far right, we have the Honorable Lisa Borders. Next to her, the Honorable Mary Norwood. State Senator Kasim Reed. Good evening. And Mr. Jesse Spikes. Please join me in welcoming them this evening. To our candidates, I say thank you so much for being here, especially given the heavy load that you have been carrying in terms of communicating your message. And we thank each of you for your service and for your commitment to the city of Atlanta. Now, you can't see their faces, but allow me to present to you a distinguished cross-section of arts and culture leaders in the community. They will be posing the questions to the candidates. First, let me introduce to you Lena Karstens, Managing Director, Dad's Garage Theater Company. Second, let me introduce to you Joe Bankoff, Chief Executive Officer of the Woodruff Arts Center. Third, David Hamilton, Principal with Praxis Three Architects and Chairman, Metropolitan Public Art Coalition. Fourth, Neil Barkley, Executive Producer and Chief Executive Officer of the National Black Arts Festival. And Stan Woodard, individual artist. Tonight's questions will come from the cultural platform created by MAC and from questions posed by members of the arts and culture community. The cultural platform was developed in a series of focus groups that included representatives from nonprofit arts and cultural groups, public art advocates, and individual artists. The platform is built from five planks. First, funding for operational support. Second, development of cultural infrastructure. Third, installation of public art. Fourth, support for individual artists and cultural workers. And fifth, the integration of arts and culture into the city's major policy areas. Candidates were briefed on the cultural platform and asked to reply in writing to questions specific to each of the topic areas. Their written responses have been made public through the Public Broadcasting Atlanta website, lensonatlanta.org, and through direct emails to the arts and culture community. By way of orientation to tonight's conversation, we begin with the central question regarding each of your candidacies. What's your vision? But this one with a twist, what's your vision around arts and culture and its importance to our community? This question was submitted in advance by Atlanta citizen Allison Laura, and here specifically is her question. Our current mayor talks about her vision of Atlanta as a world-class city 
in which the arts and culture thrive. What is your vision of a culturally vibrant city of Atlanta? And if you're elected mayor, what will you put in place in the first six months to move us toward that vision? Candidates, we'd like to give you two minutes each. And Ms. Borders, may we begin with you? Certainly. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. This is Arts. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> thank you. It's good to be with you, and I want to thank all of you all for coming tonight. Uh, this election matters to every family that wants to be safe and secure. I want to be your mayor because I'm on a mission to make Atlanta a better Atlanta, a safe Atlanta, a strong Atlanta, an inclusionary Atlanta. An Atlanta that comes together to serve both its neighbors and that reaches beyond its borders. I envision an Atlanta that draws not only from the diverse artistic traditions of our neighborhoods, but from the best ideas from around the country to support them. The arts are the soul of the city. They tell the world what matters to us and how much we value our cultural life. The arts are also an economic engine. They employ the creative class, nearly 20,000 in Atlanta alone. I see an Atlanta that attracts thousands of visitors to the revitalized Woodruff Arts Center and a gleaming symphony hall. I see a city where sculptors and visual artists use rehabilitated spaces to create a window into the heart of who we are as a city. Atlanta has grown musicians, writers, and actors, and we will continue to be a destination for those who want to use their talents to brighten our city. But a vision must have the funds to become a reality. I am the only candidate in this race with a clear vision, proven leadership, and genuine management experience. I'm the only candidate to have raised $84 million for a nonprofit, and I'm the only candidate who has directly brought jobs to the city. I'm the only candidate who's pledged to pay as I go. I look forward to having this conversation with you tonight, central to arts and our great city. I love Atlanta, and I want to be your mayor on a mission. Thank you, Ms. Borders. Ms. Norwood? And I'm Mary Norwood, and I love this city. I love every corner of this city, and I understand every corner of this city. We have a great opportunity to springboard the arts as we redevelop the city. There are so many unexplored secret places that are all over our city, many of them along the Beltline path, others along our old abandoned industrial corridors. There are wonderful buildings that are ready to be rehabilitated and have artists and colonies in them. It makes a real difference in a city if people know where the art is and know what's going on. All of us who have traveled across the globe go to cities, and the first thing we do is to say, what are we going to see? What plays, what museums, what exhibits? And I want that to be our Atlanta. So as mayor, what I will do is to springboard the redevelopment of Atlanta to work with the arts and cultural groups in the city to make sure that you have places that you can perform, places that you can exhibit, and that we make it very clear all of the great things that we have going on. One of the things that a mayor can do uniquely is to be the spokesperson, is to be the advocate, is to bring attention to all of the things that are happening in the city. And I would like to be that person. I think that we have an incredible opportunity. We have the basis with our big facilities, and then we have lots and lots and lots of smaller groups and facilities that we can draw people to. And to do that, we have to do the basics. City Hall has to work well. The city has to be safe so that you feel very comfortable going anywhere to enjoy any performance. So I want to be the mayor that just gets it done, and we have lots of new venues and lots more people coming to our venues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Norwood. Mr. Reed. Good evening. To the Metropolitan Atlanta Arts Culture Coalition, I want to thank you for having this conversation uh, tonight. Uh, I am Kasim Reed, and I want to be your mayor. And I want you to know that I believe that great cities must have great arts, and that I will be a mayor that is, co is committed uh, to bringing that and supporting what we already have in Atlanta. Specifically, you ask what I would do in the first six months if I am fortunate enough to be your mayor. 
Uh, I will start by enforcing the ordinance that Maynard Jackson put in place uh, so many years ago uh, that said that 1.5 percent of, fun of funding for construction in the city of Atlanta should actually be dedicated towards the arts. The people in this room know tonight that that is not the case. So I would immediately, as your mayor, make that the rule of the day. I would also sit down with the Woodruff Art Center and have a concrete conversation about what the city can do to build a performing arts center that is worthy of the city of Atlanta and worthy of Woodruff. I would do that in the first six months. And I would let the city know that I am committed to making sure that we have a performing arts hall that is world class and worthy of our city and find out what we can do to make that happen. But that would just be the beginning. I would focus on our small arts, arts organizations and our medium sized arts organizations and let you know that you have a mayor that will be a champion for you. And by reforming and getting the city's finances in order, Atlanta's Bureau of Cultural Affairs will be able to be a partner to you again. I have a passion for the arts, but I will back it up by work and by action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Mr. Spikes. Uh, good evening, Jesse Spikes. Um, my vision for Atlanta is very simple. It is that Atlanta will be a city uh, that's able to afford both its most basic needs and the grandest designs of its present and its future. And what I mean by that is Atlanta will be a city that will be able to provide the most basic services that we need, like public safety, uh, like fire protection, uh, in the way that it should be provided to keep us safe. But it will also be able to afford its grandest designs. And one of those grand designs, or the one that's on the scope today, is the Beltline, uh, the big project <laughs> that's going to take 25 years to build and a lot, a lot of money. Arts are important to me personally, intrinsically, because they enrich my life and they enrich other people's lives. They're important to this city in the same way, because if we're going to be able to enjoy this city in the way that we would like, then arts must be a part of that. Art and culture must be a part of that. But it's also very vital to the economic development of this city. Uh, if we are going to be the great city we claim we are going to be and attract the businesses and the professionals that we'd like to attract, then arts will be a very big part of that. Uh, as you develop this center here, look around what has happened in Midtown as a result of that. Uh, when this arts center was first developed, there was not much here. It has spurred the economic development of this area, so it's critical to the economic viability and, and success of Atlanta. So I will support it. I will support it by making sure that we're getting all of the grant funding available to us from Washington. I've talked to Ben Johnson about some of the work that he's done for the arts center and some of the lobbying he's done in Washington, of course, I would support that. Uh, Atlanta needs to be a vibrant economic center so that people will make the investments here that we would like. My focus would be on making Atlanta that vibrant economic center and, 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 and using the bullet pulpit of the mayor's office to follow your lead with respect to the specific things we ought to be doing to make sure that Atlanta is the art center that it needs to be to support it as a, the next great international city. Thank you, Mr. Spikes. In this next section, our candidates will have a minute each to respond to each question. Panelists may direct follow-up questions to one or more candidates or ask questions to clarify written responses. The first plank in our cultural platform is funding for operational support. Panelist Lena Carstens of Dad's Garage will be asking the questions. Lena. The City of Atlanta is home to more than 200 arts and culture organizations. A 2007 economic impact study of the arts in the City of Atlanta found that more than 5 million people attend cultural events every year. Nonprofit arts and culture organizations generate almost $300 million in revenues annually in the City of Atlanta. Our organizations support over 8,200 full-time jobs. And every dollar contributed to nonprofit arts groups generates an additional $13 of economic impact, according to a 2001 study by the Metro Atlanta Regional Arts Task Force. Each of you has acknowledged the importance of the arts and culture to the economy as well as to the civic life of Atlanta. You also know that the task force convened by Mayor Franklin found that annual public funding of $10 million is needed to put Atlanta on an equal footing with the support of other comparable cities. Recognizing the city's current budget challenges, 
Are you prepared to commit to look for ways to provide the needed public funding? If so, how do you envision accom accomplishing this goal? And we begin with Ms. Norwood. One of the things that we need to look at is whether or not we want to take the, a penny of our sales tax, to take a new sales tax penny and divide it among arts, green space, and transportation to deal with three of the main um, issues that we have in the city. That would be something that would have to be sold to the citizens, but it certainly is something that we ought to look at. People, when the citizens several years ago had approved the quality of life bonds, that was $150 million that the citizens approved because it was specifically for sidewalks, for improvements that people knew were going to be dedicated solely to those purposes. So that would be one thing that would be done. The second thing is to look at the revenue that we have now. We have to get the city's financial house in order. In doing so, then we will establish the credibility to be able to dedicate funding to the arts. Thank you. Mr. Reed. Well, I believe that we must start uh, by honoring our city's current ordinance. Uh, and as mayor, uh, I will do that. I believe that that's the first point. I think that the second step that we have to take, uh, I believe, is to have the mayor lead a large conversation and really explain and make the case to the people of Atlanta how vital arts are and that it doesn't benefit just one section of the community, but arts really runs throughout Atlanta and it significantly improves the lives and possibilities of our young people. We need a mayor that believes that and leads that conversation. Uh, that brings me to the model that I believe is most appropriate. I believe that Fulton County and DeKalb County and the city of Atlanta uh, should consider partnering to create um, a sales tax opportunity of some kind uh, that would be taken to the voters of the city of Atlanta and voted on by referendum so that we can talk about creating $10 million in revenue for dedicated arts funding. A mayor should lead, lead that debate and conversation. Uh, I will certainly be in favor of promoting public-private partnerships and, 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 and encouraging others to make contributions, but the question related to public funding for the arts, uh, it's no different than the other basic services that must be provided by the city of Atlanta. Uh, it's a cash-strapped city right now from a revenue standpoint. Uh, the first place to start is to get rid of the waste and misallocation that's in the system and to make sure that our ser services are being delivered in the most efficient and cost-effective fashion. If we're going to provide services, whether it's funding to the arts, uh, public safety, or anything else, we must have the resources to get it done. Unfortunately, we've had some difficult economic times more recently, but we've also not been very good stewards of the resources we've had. So to start, we must make sure that we're doing the absolute best job at City Hall to, to assure that the resources that we have are being expended in the most efficient, cost-effective fashion. And to the extent that there's misallocation, like some of the things we hear about, a uh, million and a half dollars in penalties to the IRS are eliminated so we can fund other things. Thank you. Laura, I need to answer this one. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Borders, please, you made eye contact. okay. Um, I, early, I stated earlier that I consider arts in part of this community and an economic engine. So here's what I would do to invest in the arts. Number one, the one and a half percent that we're supposed to invest in the arts, we would do that. Today, we are not including it in every bond covenant that's issued for the city of Atlanta. So we need to guarantee that it is, in fact, issued in every bond covenant so that when we go to market, the conditions are there. That's number one. Number two, we have tax allocation districts that are not performing. I would suggest that we retire those and redeploy that money. And thirdly, I have stated often that the city of Atlanta has two primary revenue streams, sales tax and property tax. We do have a conversation going on at the state, and I have added my voice to that conversation, that says we should change our sales collection tax from state collected to local co locally collected tax, which would yield more money, not new taxes. I disagree with a new tax. It would be collecting dollars that are currently on the table that are being left uncollected. So those would be the three investments that I would make in funding for the arts. Thank you. Lena? Two of the four candidates, Ms. Norwood and Mr. Reed, responded that yes, they would support this funding being administered through a separate not-for-profit organization on a contract for services basis with the city. This recommendation also came from the Cultural Investment Fund Task Force Report of 2007. 
Ms. Borders and Mr. Spikes, each of you prefer to explore a broader range of options. Would you take 30 seconds to clarify your position? Uh, my position is I will support the arts and how we govern them and how we manage them, but unless we take a comprehensive look at the financial impact, I'm not willing to say today we will just make it a separate entity. And so for that reason, I would want to explore and actually crunch the numbers. I don't believe in going headlong into any situation without being sure what the impact is going to be. So my uh, statement would be that I want all the options on the table, and I do, in fact, want to support the arts in every possible way, but I want to know what the repercussions are going to be. Thank you, Mr. Spikes. There are two approaches to it. One is using the bullet pool pit or the authority of the mayor's office to encourage others to be involved, public-private partnerships. I would certainly do that. Uh, but providing for the arts is like providing for any other basic service in the city. You must have the financial wherewithal to do it. And before I would make a commitment uh, to, to, to designate or dedicate a stream of income to any particular area, uh, I would want to be able to evaluate uh, what services we're providing in all the various areas. Uh, that it may be needed to reallocate uh, from something else to the arts or from the arts to something else. And so before I make a commitment in a particular area, I would want to be able to assess the overall situation. Thank you. Lena, thank you. The second plank in our platform is cultural infrastructure. For those questions, we turn to Joe Bankoff, CEO, Woodruff Art Center. Again, candidates, you'll have one minute each to respond to his questions. Joe. Thank you. Atlanta's existing <coughs> cultural facilities have been built almost exclusively with private dollars. Now that makes Atlanta very different from other cities that we compete with for jobs and investment. Many put significant public dollars into their cultural facilities, and these include Charlotte and Denver and Dallas and Minneapolis and Miami and Orlando and Salt Lake and Seattle, just to mention a few. Successful arts and cultural capital projects have consistently received, on average, about a third public funding in some fashion. They use a variety of methods, including building the construction of a, of a garage under a theater, or bonds, or public-funded cultural districts, or incremental sales tax referendums. But in each instance, leadership finds a source of public money so that public-private isn't just private. <laughs> We're now, clear. Atlanta, <laughs> Atlanta, in fact, as you've heard, has achieved great benefits and national and even global recognition for arts and culture. We know we have the highest concentration of arts-related employment of any of the major cities in the country. But Atlanta does not <coughs> support its arts and culture facilities and infrastructure at anywhere at a comparable level. So we've lost and we're going to continue to lose cultural assets in the absence of public advocacy and public funds for the facilities needed to sustain them. Now, we have seen what focused leadership can do, whether you look at uh, the Cobb Energy Center or an effort at the Museum for Civil and Human Rights. The mayor's agenda is an important part of the whole community's task. So each of you have been asked about support for cultural facilities, and I would like to ask you to focus on your willingness to lead in seeking the funding of facilities for arts and culture like Cobb Energy or the Woodruff Expansion, which was identified by the ACP as one of the projects that ought to be tackled by the next mayor. We understand the priority for public safety. We understand the priority for getting finances in order. But that is not all you aspire to achieve. So my question focuses on your leadership and support for putting public dollars and a finding a way to support projects that you feel are important to Atlanta and the arts. Will you? In, will investments in arts and culture facilities and infrastructure be one of your top two or three priorities for advocacy and public funding? I think Mr. We, Reed gets to start. Yes, we begin with Mr. Reed. Thank you. Uh, the answer is yes, and I didn't rate, wait to run for mayor to get started. Uh, as you know, uh, this legislative session, uh, I carried in the Senate the legislation to provide tax relief for the construction of the new performance hall and for the Civil and Human Rights Museum. And it was not an easy process, as you know. So I have shown my commitment to the arts by my work. Uh, I believe that, and I said in my opening statement, that I am absolutely committed uh, to our new performance hall. 
But more than that, I believe that I am uniquely qualified to get additional help from the state of Georgia, as I have on a number of projects for the city of Atlanta. So it's not going to be enough for Atlanta to step up, which I am absolutely committed to doing. You're going to need a person who can work at the state level uh, and deliver concrete results, as I have on water and sewer, as I have on protecting the Beltline, as I have on generating revenue for police and fire. I would, be, I would be willing to lead both in terms of uh, advocacy and public funding. Um, because of the intrinsic value of the arts, of course, I'm, I'm interested in it. But as I said to you earlier, because of the economic driver that the arts are for the city, and if we're going to be a world-class city, uh, we must have certain amenities for people we want to attract. That type of advocacy also creates the basis for the other things I want to do in city government. Uh, and that is, and it is about getting the financial house in order, because if we want to go and do public funding for any kind of infrastructure development, capital improvement, we must go to the, if, we, if we're going to use the city's credit, to the bond market to do that. And until we improve, restore our bond rating, it's going to be more expensive. Uh, and until we get our financial house in order, we are not going to be able to afford to do it at a reasonable cost. So for me, the argument for being an advocate and supporting public funding helps my other agenda, which I think is primary, and that is making sure that Atlanta is a sound, fiscally sound city. Uh, Joe, the answer is yes and yes. Uh, I constantly talk about this two-legged stool, and I want to see legs three and four so that it is a sustainable financial model, and I see the arts as a part of that third leg. Uh, for sustainability, for the financial model of the city. So I would suggest that public-private partnerships should be two-sided. It should not just be all private, although in my day job, you are very well aware that I have a public and a private hat at the Grady Health System, and we've raised $84 million in just nine months. So I am clear that the state could help us. I am not clear that they will help us. They have not helped us on water. They have not helped us on transportation. They have not helped us on Grady. So I think going back, my first act would be to pass an administrative order to say we must, at every bond issue, ensure that the 1.5 percent does in fact get designated for the arts, put in the bond covenants, and tracked. That's number one. And number two, that the TAD dollars get retired and redeployed, those that are not working. And, and Joe, my answer is yes and yes. Uh, the economic argument is very strong, and the mayor needs to convey that to the business community, to the residents of the city, and to do everything in his or her power to make sure that the funding becomes available. I am delighted with the new performance hall uh, when, I, when I met with you and your staff, and it is a fabulous opportunity for us in Atlanta and should be an absolutely we need, to, we need to get there. But what we have at the city is sins of our fathers. We have so much debt and we have so many encumbrances on our general fund that it is going to be, it is going to take a lot to clean that up to then look at how we get new funding for anything. Mr. Reed, 30 seconds. Uh, I wanted to push back a bit on my friend uh, Ms. Borders' comments about the state failing to help on our major issues. First of all, we did pass the sales tax legislation that did, will help Woodruff. We did that this session. Second of all, uh, the state provided $500 million in low interest loans and continues to do so for the city of Atlanta's water and sewer repair. We also passed the municipal option sales tax, which uh, provides for 40% of the funding is now paid by people outside of the city of Atlanta. And regarding Grady, we passed a super speeders bill that generates $23 million in additional revenue that Grady Hospital gets a portion of because of the amount of indigent care that Grady produces. So that statement was inaccurate and false. Well, Ms. Borders. And let me push back. <laughs> it's getting interesting now. Uh, Grady does not have, or the state of Georgia does not have a trauma funded network is what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And on the water and sewer issue, I wasn't talking about Atlanta. I was talking about a state water plan. As you know, Judge Magnuson out of Indiana, if I'm not mistaken, has ruled that we can no longer take water out of Lake Lanier. So I'm talking much longer term. I appreciate what's been done thus far for the city of Atlanta, but I am talking about the entire state and economic development for generations to come. Well, Thank, you. I'm, Thank you. Let's. 
One, one round of rebuttal per question. New ground rule. Thank you all. It's been a long day. It's been, yeah. long. It has been a long day. I figured, Joe. I, I, uh, I hear everybody loud and clear on the will you, and I know you want it. The question I have now is the how's you. The question I want you to think about, and I've heard pieces of it, but it'll go back to this with both state and local and other reallocations. How would each of you propose to meet the challenge of supporting the city's cultural facilities to bring Atlanta in line with the other great cities in the country in the support of the arts and cultural capital infrastructure? Mr. Spikes. You know, the, the advocacy part of it is very easy because you'd simply be encouraging people to use their other people's money uh, to get it done. And so you can go to the state, go to the federal government, corporations, individuals. So that's easy. The hard part is the public funding of it. It's, it's hard because funding police officers today is very difficult. Funding fire stations today is very difficult. And it's not just a matter of having the revenues available. It's also the cost of funding once you go to the credit markets. So the most significant thing that the next mayor must do is to make sure that Atlanta is a financially sound city. And that starts with being good shepherds of the resources we already have. We've not always been that. I mentioned the $1.6 million we we're wasting by paying it to IRS for not paying the pension benefits in time. Uh, there, there, there are endless examples. I mean, an IT system that should have cost us $22 million, we spent $65 million on. So the, the most important thing that I will do as a mayor of this city is to make sure that we have a city that will be able to afford its most basic needs and the grandest design of its future. And part of that will be the arts. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that we are not doing well is enforcing the law that's on the books and tracking the dollars. So I think part of the how, obviously, is being able to identify the money, track the money, and account to the citizens how the money is being spent. On my website, bordersforatlanta.com, there's a page called Accountability Atlanta, which is the example of how I will govern that demonstrates where money is coming from and where money is going. And I think that would give a much more clear and transparent view of what's going on with the city finances. So the how is actually enforcing the ordinance that we have today in place, and I don't know that any of us would agree that we want to take it away. We want to make sure that it works and works well. So I think enforcing what's there today and redeploying dollars that are not being spent well in our tax allocation districts because the arts, in my view, are an economic engine and do, in fact, qualify <coughs> for those dollars. As I, as I look at where we are today, we have got to restore the public's confidence in the city's ability to manage its money and to be transparent as to where its, money, where its money is going. We have not done that over the past 20 years that I have been involved, and the opaque system that we have has been troubling to me and is one of the reasons that I am running for mayor. So to be ruthlessly honest, we have got to clean that up first before I can go back to citizens and say we want to float a bond issuance to help build a new symphony hall. That's got to be done first. But that being said, we in this past dozen years have floated bonds for all kinds of different projects, whether it's homeless opportunity bonds, whether it is uh, um, housing opportunity bonds, whether it's just a, a myriad of things. So yes, I will work with you to build the public support Y'all are doing a great job tonight. I love the fact that you are all here united. I think that is a fabulous, fabulous step, and I will work with you to make that happen. Well, I think I've been in the dead column, and I'll be in. I'll continue to be in the dead column. Uh, when Woodruff needed help, I acted, and that's what I will do as mayor. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the ordinance regarding public funding for the arts has not been enforced for the last seven years. So I think to sit here and say that it will be enforced, the question should arise, well, why do you not advocate for the enforcement during the last seven years? So we must certainly do that. But we also have to have a big conversation with the leadership of the, of the Woodruff and other important partners to ask what can the city do to really open up the city's books and say this is where we are right now, but what facilities and capabilities can we provide you to advance what we all agree is a very significant public purpose 
uh, which is the art for our city. I would do that as mayor, enforce the ordinance. I would advocate at the state level. I would do everything that the city could do right now. And when the city was stronger fiscally, uh, I would move uh, to do more. I'm going to take one more. <clears throat> um, let me follow up, if I can, on the how. Uh, Ms. Borders, you have suggested that the city ought to look at the reallocation of the tax allocation districts, mm -hmm. uh, looking at those and whether we're getting the bang for the buck in effect. A number of cities have used the creation of one or more cultural districts to attract and support arts and cultural activities mm -hmm. and the re related retail, restaurants, hotels, residential and visitor amenities. But to be effective, the cultural districts have to have some sort of a funding mechanism dedicated to that purpose. That's Meridian Avenue in Indianapolis. You've seen it in lots of other places. And some cities have multiple districts. Would each of you be willing to support taking a look at the creation of arts and cultural districts, or one or more, for the whole city or for parts of the city? Uh, because we have lots of great arts in this city. And what funding streams would you be willing to look at? You mentioned the tax allocation. Are there others? Uh, Joe, I absolutely would be willing to consider not just one, but several. I think we need to be very um, comprehensive about how we do these things. I am very much opposed to doing it in one part of town and in not another. That's part of how we've got this development that's all hodgepodge, intense in one area and blighted in another. So certainly, but the city of Atlanta can't do it without the state allowing us to create a cultural district. We've talked about this apparently for years, and we've not gotten it done. And so I'd be willing to consider it not just one, but many across the city. And identify, I identify the tax allocation districts because those are the easiest funding mechanisms that we already have in place. We need to be evaluating their use and the impact that they're having on an annual basis. And when they're working, you keep them going. And when they're not working, you take them back and redeploy the money. Ms. Norwood? Well, what I think is special about Atlanta is that it's already starting to go in that direction. When you look at Castleberry Hill and, and its arts um, first Fridays, it's just it's wonderful. So we are unique we are unique in our built environment that there are places just like Castleberry. I mean look at King Plow. Look at all the different places all across the city. The Beltline is going to be a fabulous um, if we do it right, if we build it out right, with some of the existing structures that are all along the Beltline, the historic structures that can be rehabbed. And can you imagine the Beltline if every single part of it had a theater, a, where performing arts, uh, galleries, exhibits? Uh, we could have really, really fabulous places all along the Beltline that would have people using the Beltline 24-7. So I think that we've got an unusual city in that our built environment already could do that well if we will get it safe, get it clean, and have it be friendly. Uh, I would certainly consider it, Joe, but that would not be my preferred method. Uh, I believe that the strongest, uh, the strongest example that I have seen uh, and studied is the Denver model where they have seven counties that have joined together and made the decision that they will provide a percentage of a sales tax uh, that goes towards the arts. That's why Denver generates $42 million a year for the arts, and it, it is done without regard to where the particular institution is cited. So there was leadership that was strong enough to convince the citizens of a seven-county area that this was vital in order for them all to thrive. I believe that we can achieve the same thing in Atlanta. Being mayor is about leading at the end of the day. I believe that Fulton County and DeKalb County and the city of Atlanta should partner, should have a robust debate about the importance of the arts, how we're going to fund it, and should have a referendum on it and create a stream of revenue for the arts. I certainly would, would support it and consider it. Uh, it would be great to, to have it reason why uh, we can't even uh, solve our crime problems. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit more difficult, uh, not as easy as we might think, to coordinate uh, the arts. Uh, creating the districts would be, yeah, a great idea and, and because it would provide an initial funding source. And it also would entail a, a, a public-private partnership because there's going to be somebody on the other side who's going to be doing that building. 
But again, I mean, yes, so I would consider that. I would be willing to uh, create the districts that make sense. Uh, but again, it all comes back to the city, what the city can do. And it all comes back to the city's credit standing. It's about having the funding. It's about having the credit standing that will enable us to go to the market and borrow the money that needs to be borrowed at a decent interest rate. And until we've dealt with the basic finances of the city, we're not going to be in position to do that. So that's why I'm going to focus on making sure that we are on a sound financial footing so that we can do the arts and public safety. Thank you. Thank you all. Joe, thanks. Our next questioner is David Hamilton, Chairman Metro Atlanta Public Art Coalition and Principal of Praxis Architects Three. He will engage our candidates on our third platform item, <coughs> public art. Candidates, you'll have one minute to respond to each question. And just to shake it up, we're going to start with Mr. Spikes and rotate back the other way. <laughs> Mr. Spikes, sir, to you. Thank you, Mara. As our city and country emerge from what has been the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, we will need to find new ways of competing with cities that have far more developed public places, spaces, and rich programs of public art. Indeed, in order to compete for the highly educated and sophisticated workforce that will drive economic growth in the 21st century, Atlanta must provide an urbane, well-designed, exceptional cityscape. This new city must be comparable to our competition. Places like Chicago, Dallas, Houston, Seattle, Los Angeles, even Nashville and Charlotte have all paid far more attention to public spaces and public art than we have. For Atlanta to be successful, we must ensure that inclusion of public art in major projects like the Beltline, Peachtree Corridor, and future developments, both public and private, becomes a reality. These projects have the potential not only to improve Atlanta's economic appeal, but to make the city a richer and more valued place for everyone, residents and tourists alike. At present, a city ordinance requires that 1.5 percent of the eligible funds of the construction amount of all eligible city-sponsored capital projects be set aside for public art. In past years, not just seven, but 32 to be exact, since 1977, when the original ordinance was enacted, there have been deep and systemic problems in enforcement of this ordinance, specifically with the lack of proper collection of funds, no collection of funds in many cases in many years, a lack of accountability of city departments overseeing capital projects. This ordinance was recently rewritten with proper collection mechanism and a process for accountability. We should note that the enforcement of this ordinance is not only a matter of crafting correctly worded laws, but also a matter of having the political will and inclination to make sure that these funds are both collected and used properly to fund public art or public arts facilities in Atlanta. The community's question to you is this. Will you support the currently mandated 1.5% public art ordinance and ensure the proper collection of funds from eligible city capital improvement projects. Further, how will you ensure that these funds are properly spent? Uh, yes, I will. And what you're talking about is not just for the art, it's systemic within the city of Atlanta. Uh, you, water department is the same way. Uh, we don't collect the water rates either. Uh, parking fees are the same way. We don't collect the parking fees. So we're not operating at optimal efficiency right now. Uh, the tree fund is, is the same way. We don't, we, don't re, we don't replenish that as well. We don't use that money for the purposes intended. So what we need is a more accountable city government. If you're not going to enforce the rules, then you should, you should repeal the rules. You shouldn't have them on the books. It is not a matter of singling out the art for that purpose. It is making sure that government is accountable generally, that it, that it, that it does what it's supposed to do, that it delivers the services that it's says it's going to, not make the promises and then disappear on you. So it would be the same with the arts as with watershed management, as with parking, as with any other department in this city. We would set the rules and then we would, we would enforce them. Thank you. Mr. Reed. Uh, Mara, I believe that this is another uh, area where the problem is, is, the, is our will. It's not that we don't have the capability. And I will tell you, uh, before I ever ran for mayor or any of that, um, I spend my private time uh, involved on the board of the Metropolitan Atlanta Arts Fund, which is a wonderful organization that focuses on funding small and medium-sized arts organizations. I also spend my time on the National Black Arts Festival. Uh, nothing political related, but just because I believe deeply uh, that arts are vital uh, to our soul. 
And I'm also a kid that, that had very profound experiences as a result of arts that I experienced in high school. I give you that background just to say that, that this is important to me. And if I am your mayor, enforcing this ordinance will be important to me because I understand what arts can do for an individual and what arts do for our community. And my answer is yes. I have been clamoring for the kind of transparency and accountability that you're talking about. And I will have on the city's website very clear, very concise information that shows where the money is coming from, how it's being allocated, and what it's going to be used for. So it will be a line item, it will be very clear, and there will be no one who will not obey the rules. Hi, David. Uh, the answer is yes and yes. Uh, in a former life, I actually worked for a developer, and the department I led was actually partly responsible for public art. And we didn't build buildings or build shopping centers without public art. So whether you look at Bank of America or the Pinnacle, uh, or you look at the avenue at Peachtree City, there is public art everywhere. Because we understood then, and I understand now, the value of adding art to not just commercial projects, but all throughout the city. So I would suggest that it will take leadership, certainly, but more importantly, it will take the tactical means, the infrastructure, to track the dollars, to make sure that the technical pieces of the bond covenants are actually in place, and I keep harping on that because that is not the case today. So whether we're talking about the Beltline in the future or any other capital projects, I think we have to make sure it's in the bond covenants, number one, and then number two, ensure that the law department ensures that we are complying, every department in the city, not just one or two. Thank you. And uh, my final question tonight uh, actually deals with the uh, tax allocation districts. Um, a significant portion of the city's new development uh, when, will be taking place in and around the city's tax allocation districts. Will you, as mayor of Atlanta, actively support, as concrete policy, directly earmarking 1.5 percent of future bond issues or future tax increments for public art and public arts facilities and all of the city's TADs, including the Beltline? And again, how will you ensure that these monies are properly spent on public art and public arts facilities? Ms. Norwood? Okay. Um, yes, I will do that. Um, the Beltline, as I just stated a little earlier, uh, I believe can be a great gathering space. And when you have great gathering spaces, you want performances, you want exhibits, you want things to do besides restaurants and, and um, eating and drinking. Uh, so I believe that it will be, it can become one of the great gathering spaces all along the Beltline. So I'd like to see that built out quicker rather than later. Um, as far as enforcement, again, I think you, you make sure that as every dollar comes through, you know where it's spent. That is not the case today with many of our funds, including the impact fee funds that we have that are not transparent. Ms. Borders. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to Mr. Reed. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, the bond covenants that will be written for the next or prospective uh, issuances of bonds is where we would have to include them. Obviously, we cannot go backward. So absolutely, we expect that the Beltline will be an economic engine as well. So it has its own tax allocation district, which is very different from the other nine. It's circular and is throughout the entire city, which would also allow us the opportunity to distribute public art all across the city as opposed to one linear uh, corridor, which is how the other belt line, or excuse me, how the other tax allocation districts are constructed. Mr. Spites. I would like to, uh, but I, I would not commit to do that tonight. Uh, as we go forward with these projects, uh, there are going to be a lot of competing interests involved. Uh, my job as mayor will be to make sure that when these interests compete, we have a process in place that will get them resolved fairly and in the best interest of the city. Art is very important to me, uh, as are a lot of other interests in the city. And so my job will be to resolve those conflicts when they develop in a fair and equitable way. Uh, I am a lover of the arts, I'm a supporter of the arts, uh, and I will be there as someone who's looking to make sure that we do for the arts as we should with respect to the city. 
but there are also other interests that I'll be considering at the time. And my final decision will be based on what, as after we come together as a community, what is concluded to be in the best interest of this city as a whole. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Uh, my answer is yes, I will. Uh, and I will certainly monitor and ensure that the dollars are being spent in the appropriate areas uh, for one simple reason. If Atlanta is really going to move to where it should be from an arts standpoint, we're going to have to start making very bold and clear decisions and, and staking out a position and enforcing our own laws and ordinances. And this would be the beginning of that process. The Beltline, because it is such a comprehensive initiative that will involve uh, the work of citizens in our city uh, for literally 10 to 15 years to come, uh, is an important uh, step. And by making a statement that the Beltline and the tax allocation districts that are related to it uh, must have the component for public art, uh, you begin to move the needle in the city of Atlanta, and we really do start moving towards becoming a true arts city. But we can't say one thing and then do another when it's time to do what is hard. We've got to make these decisions now and stick with them. Thank you all. Our next panelist, artist Stan Woodard, has questions for the candidates regarding individual artists and cultural workers within the creative industries. Candidates will have one minute to respond to each question. Stan. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, candidates, for being here. The city of Atlanta has the largest per capita employment in the arts and culture industry of any American city. The creative industries are the high octane fuel that drives the major portion of Atlanta's economy and represent one of the fastest growing segments of the nation's economy. As of 2008, the city of Atlanta is home to 2,400 arts related businesses that employ 23,000 people and offer opportunities for thousands of individual artists. Atlanta is a mecca for the music and film industries. Yet many artists and cultural workers can no longer find affordable studio space or afford to live in the city of Atlanta. And you can uh, keep in mind that this neighborhood, uh, Midtown, that we're in um, at one time was a de facto organically grown arts district. And that's changed over the past 30 years. And I can argue that Castleberry Hill, uh, which was heavily uh, populated by artists and small almost invisible arts organizations um, is quickly changing um, as a developer's dream. Our cultural platform calls upon the next mayor to create an action plan and policies to support the attraction and retention of artists and others in the creative workforce and to address their need for affordable workspace and housing. It might not come as a surprise then that my first question is, how would you, each of you, direct your administration to support affordable housing for artists and culture industry workers. Ms. Borders, we'll begin with you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, interestingly enough, the housing market or the real estate market has crashed here in Atlanta, much as it has done all across the country. And obviously, real estate is to Atlanta what cars were to Detroit and entertainment is to LA. And so I understand, and we all understand, that we have an opportunity now to bring housing back online that is in foreclosure, the highest number of foreclosures in the nation or in a zip code in Atlanta in 30318. So my suggestion would be to bring these assets back online. I have already started talking to the banks that are here in the city uh, who have these toxic assets on their books to bring them back online, not only for artists, but for police officers and firefighters and zookeepers. And I've talked to Dennis Kelly and his group about this already. So creating space for affordable housing as well as studio space or workspace for artists. We have that opportunity now and the banks are willing to do it. Today they are making no money uh, on these residences and we are losing tax revenue. So we in fact have an opportunity here to meet demand or match demand with resources. Thank you. Mr. Spikes? Uh, the affordable housing is a big issue and it's not just with respect to the artists, uh, it's with respect to different income categories in this city, and it's something that must be addressed categorically, not just for studios or for particular groups of people. Uh, the current economic situation and the real estate market does provide opportunities for us to take advantage uh, of some of the foreclosed locations and to negotiate with private partners 
to redevelop some of that housing. There are a number of groups in this city who spend their lives working on affordable housing. So to be an advocate for that and to bring those groups together and to work with uh, the private partners who are already involved uh, in that effort uh, would, would be, be the way I'd approach it. Code enforcement could be another way for us to address that, for the city to have a stronger code that would enable us to take over some of these abandoned properties, uh, or the ones that are not maintained, and to take the initiative in, in redeveloping them would also be another way for us to develop a, broad, a broader scale of affordable housing. Uh, San Francisco has the model that I like most. Uh, what they took in the area in San Francisco, which has extremely high real estate prices, and this was before the crash, and it used to be a warehouse section in San Francisco. And what they did was to take that area and allow artists to live, work in their studio, and actually sell uh, from their studio, and it transformed a five-block area. Uh, I believe that we can do something similar to that in Atlanta because of the real estate collapse that Ms. Border cited. So I would turn my energy uh, to doing that very quickly. I actually know where I would like it to be. You might be able to convince me uh, otherwise. But I think that the fairly popular district along where the Tabernacle area is, where the Rialto Theater, would be an exciting place for artists' residences, where artists could live, work, and play in their environment. But I think that now is the time for us to think it through and then soon act. And I have already been involved in affordable housing as a city council member uh, and helped create the Home Atlanta program, which is down payment assistance, so that first-time home buyers could move into the city and could move back into the neighborhoods. I show this map a lot. This is the city of Atlanta. You will see part of it in green, and you'll see part of it in orange, red, and yellow. Uh, the orange, red, and yellow section has not seen development for 50 years. We have neighborhoods where we have urban pioneers who came in and living alongside the traditional residents of those neighborhoods, and they are not safe, and they ha have undergone mortgage fraud, and they have deteriorated. But they are ripe for exactly what you're talking about, and there are neighborhood commercial districts and warehouse districts all throughout our city not just in one or two places. So we have the built environment ready to go if, we get, if the city does its job in getting the city safe and getting the city cleaned up. Thank you. Um, I have a question here that was sent in by arts community member Brad Casey. Mm. And um, it really is a direct follow-up because I think almost, I think each of you spoke about um, reclaiming some of these so-called toxic assets. This question is a little bit different. With affordable space being the primary concern of many arts organizations and artists, and the city owning a great deal of real estate, including buildings and even a few theaters, Mr. Casey would like to hear how you will leverage the city's existing physical assets to help provide affordable rehearsal, studio, and performing spaces for artists and arts organizations currently struggling to produce and perform within the city's limits. Mr. Spice, we'll begin with you. Well, you know, an example of that is True Colors Theater. Uh, it was down at the 14th Street Theater. Uh, it's been a number of different places. Kenny Leon uh, was at the Alliance for a long time. Now they're operating that facility. They're operating True Colors out of the uh, Arts and Cultural Center in Fulton County down on New Hope Road. Uh, that's a perfect example of how you take a public facility and you partner with a private entity to make it work for the community. Now, the city is not going to be able to, we can't afford police officers today, so it's not, I'm not going to sit and tell you that I'm going to go and redevelop all these properties that we own uh, to, to, to make it affordable. But I will tell you that I will be there ready to partner with you to make available to you the resources that we have so that they can be redeveloped. And if we ever get to the point, and we will someday get to the point where we can make direct investments, then I would be willing to do that as well. But in the meantime, you got to help me, and I'll work with you to get it done. Thanks. Stan, I actually think that's an, an excellent idea. I hope the, the person that wrote the question doesn't mind hearing it again on the campaign trail a little bit, uh, because I just think it's sound. Uh, but that's the beauty of running for mayor, really. I mean, as you move around the city, you have the opportunity to get ideas like the one that I just have. I've been through 36 debates, 
and have not heard a recommendation like that. Uh, I believe that we should inventory the city of Atlanta's property, see what the city can afford to do, and how to help. But I will be a mayor who is open and willing to listen and learn about other people's ideas of how we can help small and medium-sized arts organizations especially. Uh, I have looked at the budgets for small and medium-sized arts organizations for years uh, as a part of the Metropolitan Arts Fund. So to the extent that we can leverage what the city has to be of helpful to them in any way, uh, that is something that I would be willing to learn about uh, and help with. And I would like to do the inventory bit a little differently. Um, we've got recreation centers that now have been closed this year. I would like to go to the arts community and say, here are centers. Um, come and show and give us a proposal as to what you may be able to do with our youth, with our children, and in exchange for performing space, for living space, uh, as well as other buildings that the city owns. So I would look at what we have. I would inventory that and say, here are facilities that we would love to have you be a partner with us in. And that, again, could be either uh, tutoring, uh, working on projects, uh, having performances, and, uh, and having living space. Well, all of us are talking about inventorying the property in the city, and I think that's certainly a good idea. But one of the things that's clear to me is we do not have property management in the city. We have not taken good care of our facilities for decades. And so I would be remiss to want anyone to move into anything or for the city to get in that business. It's not that we don't have assets, we do. They need to be inventoried, they need to be reviewed and fully vetted to make sure that they are safe and habitable. And if they are, then my suggestion would be that we have a public-private partnership, that we have a partner that actually runs a program like that for us. I've talked about this with our recreation centers, that we should partner with someone like the Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA so that we still own the facilities, but they are operated and staffed by someone who does that for a living, who can actually maintain that type of real estate. Because we just, cities across America do not do that well. And I don't want to have mission creep. That's very difficult for Atlanta. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Schweitz. You know, some of the best ideas that have been, Atlanta is a city of visionaries and dreamers, and some of the best ideas that have been implemented did not come from City Hall. Uh, there's been a partnership with City Hall and business and the civic community to, to make this city into what it's become. Some of the best minds, the most creative minds in this city and the world are in this room and in this community. And it's going to be very important to put those minds to work, to come up with creative solutions. And what you're going to need in City Hall is someone who's willing to work with you to get it done. Because City Hall is not going to be able to do it on its own. Thank you all. Stan, thank you. Our thank next you. panelist, Neil Barkley, executive producer and chief executive officer of the National Black Arts Festival, will address our final platform issue regarding the creative industry. Candidates will have one minute to answer questions. Neil. As most of you know, I'm a fairly newcomer to the city of Atlanta, and I'm very encouraged by this conversation, I must say. But my own career has allowed me to work in three cities who have used the creative economies to transform themselves, Austin, Texas, Los Angeles, and most recently, the city of Pittsburgh. Businesses in the cultural sector play a significant role in the city's social and economic vibrancy. They enhance Atlanta's ability to attract new businesses, add to the quality of life that makes our city competitive and attractive, and are a cornerstone of the city's tourism and economic development efforts. In order to be competitive and use its creative resources to its best advantage, the city of Atlanta must develop a comprehensive understanding of the role that creative industries play in these vital aspects of our city's health and well-being and have a way of measuring the success of its efforts. The arts platform you were provided asked about your dedication to create and implement a benchmarked plan of action that integrates the arts into all aspects of city policy, including economic and workforce development, housing, tourism, 
public spaces, parks, and the overall quality of life. My question is this. When the arts community creates a report card for your administration, by what benchmarks would you suggest we measure your administration's success in achieving the goals that you have outlined for us this evening? We'll, we'll, we'll start with Mr. Reed in answering this question. Well, you came into the market with a bang, Neil. <laughs> Well, Neil, first, welcome to Atlanta. We are so glad that you decided uh, to come uh, to our city. I believe that tonight is an appropriate measure. You know, the great thing about all of this recording that's going on is you get to say what we, we, what we meant at the time when we were running, and I think that you should hold us accountable. I think an early report card would be, did we honor our commitment regarding the 1.5% uh, ordinance that has not been enforced? Did we honor our commitment regarding having a meeting immediately with the Woodruff Art Center to determine how we could be of support uh, to the Opera Center, uh, to the uh, Performance Hall here? I think that you could measure us on making sure uh, that the Beltline uh, included uh, public art as an essential part of the Beltline and its uh, bond covenants and all of the rest. I think that you can look at the amount of personal involvement uh, that a mayor takes and dedicates to raising the level of, the, of arts funding. And I think last and finally, you can look at whether a mayor led a bold initiative for regional funding of the arts that gives us a perpetual revenue stream that moves towards the $10 million goal. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Ms. Norwood? I think we need to look at wh where we are today and, where we, get, and we, where, where we get to. How many performances, how many exhibits, how many new artists have moved into the city? Uh, how many people are attending? How, the city has, um, how well the city has marketed? Um, how many times you get press coverage? How many times the mayor and, and other city leaders are involved? Uh, I believe that we ought to measure it on how many children participate. We have got, as I said about the rec centers, we have got places all over the city and we have children who do not have that kind of exposure. And I know young audiences has done a lot and we have groups here that have done a lot. But I think you take it to the next level. Um, certainly building out the Beltline and making sure that that space is right so that it is a welcoming space, the built environment, and I'm talking in the broad sense, so that people want to come and, and experience what's going on. So the, um, and I think the other measure would be the ability of the city to sell the economic argument, because that's what's important. It has to be dollars and cents with the city's current financial crisis. Thank you, Ms. Borders. Yes, uh, Neil, welcome also to Atlanta. It's good to see you here. Uh, I think you start with the investment that we've made, not just the 1.5 percent, but what have we done over and beyond the public piece? Did we invite the private sector and the nonprofit sector to participate? And as mayor, were we able to bring resources to the table? How many artists in residence do we actually have in the city of Atlanta? How many residences do we have? How many studio venues do we have? Uh, I think what we have to do is actually put quantifiable numbers in terms of our objectives. What are we trying to get to? The $10 million, is, I see it, is a floor. And I would hope that we would be able to do more, but certainly that we had met that $10 million obligation for that investment. I heard Lena tell us we are getting $13 uh, for every dollar we invest today. I'd like to see that be a heck of a lot higher, but that is already higher than when we invest a dollar in tourism. I think we get $7.15 back or something to that effect. So making sure that we have turned arts into a true economic engine, looking at the demonstrated impact would be what I would be want to be measured on as your mayor. Uh, we can clearly benchmark it uh, objectively. We know where we stand. We've heard recitations tonight about where Atlanta stands in relation to other cities in this country. So we'll be able to measure at the end of my administration how much progress we've made against those benchmarks objectively. But the way you will measure me will be whether or not you're invited to the table, whether you're allowed to participate, and whether what you had to say had an impact. 
whether Justice Sparks was an advocate for the arts when he was in the mayor's office with respect to making the economic case for arts uh, with, the, with the private partners, but also with government, going to Washington, making sure we're getting the grant dollars that we, we are to which we're entitled. But the most important way alongside that that you will measure me will be how many dollars did I bring to the table for the arts? How much funding was I really able to provide? Uh, were you able to get the bond funding that you needed for the cultural district? Uh, were you able to get direct investments through funding of the ordinance that was put on the books? Was Atlanta able to pay the bill when the bill came due? And I want to add one thing. The, I would say another benchmark would be implementing the recommendations of the task force for the cultural investment fund. Um, this, this is a lot of work by a lot of people very well connected, and it ought to be, it ought to be implemented. So that would be another benchmark. Thank you. Uh, the last question of the evening, some may suggest thankfully, uh, <laughs> requires uh, a simple yes or no answer, but I believe we have a little bit more time if you care to elaborate from each of the candidates. Uh, simply put, would you commit to adding an arts and cultural representative to your mayoral transition teams? Ms. Norwood, start with you. Yes. <laughs> yes, I've done it before. Yes. Absolutely. Yay. That was easy. But wait, we're not, we, we were kidding. We were kidding about the last question. We have one more. Um, I think the audience would agree that our candidates have done an absolutely stellar job. of answering our questions, but really, really staying focused on the issues of importance to this sector of the city's community. And so we appreciate that so much. And as an expression of our gratitude, we want to allow you the opportunity to make two minutes of closing statements. And I would just note that each of you has referenced on multiple occasions the importance of returning our great city to sound fiscal health, financial accountability, and transparency. And so we'd love to hear your thoughts on, on the, one, the top one or two things that you're going to be doing in that regard and any other comments that you would like to make with two minutes each. And we will begin with, uh, I think that was... Start on the other end. I got to start, so try to be fair. Yeah, you know, I think we can start with Mr. Spikes. I'm trying to be fair. Hey, we've done this so many times. We try. It's a layup question. Oh. It, it, it is clear that uh, Atlanta's best days are still ahead of it. As I mentioned to you, we're a city of dreamers and visionaries. Uh, our vision has always been ahead of our reality, and that's why we've been able to accomplish so much as we've, as we've lived through our history. But we're in a very challenging time today. Uh, and while our best days are still ahead, we have some critical decisions to make. Uh, and the next few years are going to be very difficult. Atlanta is in a crisis, and it needs a new skill set. Uh, business as usual has not gotten the job done. Uh, we're in a financial crisis, and talking about problems does not get them solved. So as we go forward in this campaign to Election Day, I want you to ask yourself three questions. The first one is, uh, who has the skills to get the job done? Uh, clearly, we're in this crisis, and we've had people in City Hall, and they have failed us. And we, I'm asking you not to send them back and give them the opportunity to fail us again. It is time for Atlanta to have a new perspective and fresh ideas. We need people who can not just identify problems and complain about them sitting up here, but who can also go down to City Hall and solve them. I have developed that skill set. I'm, I know how to investigate, solve problems. I have the financial and business skills needed to resolve these very complex financial business issues. The second question is, whom can you trust to get the job done? As I said, we've had people in City Hall through now, and these problems have developed. If you want to know what someone is likely to do in the future, uh, look at what they've done in the past. We cannot afford to simply keep talking about these problems. We must take decisive action. And the third question I have for you is your job as, as voters. What is your job? 
Your job as voters, our job as voters to send to, is to give ourselves, our children, our neighborhood, our state, our region, the very best chance it has of being successful in taking its place in the, regional, in, in the global economy. And I ask you to ask those three questions and answer them honestly in the mirror, and whatever you decide in that process, we will be fine. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Mara, I want to thank you uh, for being such a gracious moderator. I also want to acknowledge Flora Maria, um, who is adding so much to our city for the Metropolitan Arts and Culture Coalition. Uh, I want you to know this. Uh, I want to be your mayor because this city has been very good to me. It allowed me to serve for four years in the Georgia House and seven years in the Georgia State Senate, uh, representing the city of Atlanta's interests. And what I want you to know is I believe that I am the right person for right now because we have some tough challenges ahead that need tested, calm, and stable leadership to deal with them. When Atlanta has faced challenges, I have gotten a call. When it was time to fund our water and sewer challenges, I carried the legislation that got it done. When it was time to pay for more police and firefighters, I merged the municipal court and the traffic court and got more money for police. When the Beltline was in jeopardy because of the Supreme Court decision, I got the call and co-wrote the constitutional amendment that allowed the Beltline to receive its full share of funding in the future. And when the Woodruff needed tax uh, assistance, I got the call and delivered. What we need is a mayor right now who will stand and deliver again and again and again, and I want to be that mayor for you. I also want you to know that my feeling about the arts and culture in our city did not come when I started running for office, and I, I don't th I'm not saying anything bad about anyone else. What I am saying is, is that if you support me and make me your mayor, you will have a person that has a genuine interest and in passion in small and medium-sized arts, but who understands the significance of the Woodruff and how powerful it is in moving our city forward. You will have a friend who stands and delivers for you again and again and again. Thank you. Ms. Nolan. And I want to be your mayor because I care deeply about this city and deeply about every community in this city and understand and know every community in this city. Tonight has been fun. A lot of our campaign trails have been about what's wrong with the city, and we focused on crime, and we focused on finances. Today, tonight, we're focusing on the best of Atlanta. We're focusing on the promise and the future and the hope and the creativity. That's what makes us different in Atlanta. This is a great city. It just needs someone at City Hall who is focused on the nuts and bolts of the city, who is focused on having it be safe everywhere. People are not coming to your performances or your exhibits or your, or your um, whatever, um, <laughs> performances, exhibits, or any other, any other exhibition if they are not safe, if the city is not clean, if it doesn't work well. So it all has to work well. The transportation has to work well. The marketing has to work well. And the people have to want to come in. So we need to have the city shine again. We need the region, people in the region and people across the world to say, I want to go there. I want to see that. I want to experience that. The mayor's job is to make the city work. That is the job that I want to do. We have had 100,000 new residents come in. They continue to flock to our city. I want them to love it when they're here. You are an important part of that, and I look forward, if I'm allowed to be your mayor, to working with you every day so that you can thrive and you can flourish in this city. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Borders. Well, Mara, I want to thank you also, and Flora Maria, and certainly all of our panelists, our subject matter experts. You have driven good questions to us, and we appreciate the opportunity. I certainly do. Uh, Atlanta is in a very special place. I love this city. I believe in this city. I have wanted to be the mayor since I was 11 years old. It's been 40 years in the making, but here we are. 
Uh, I would tell you we have the opportunity to decide between a promising future or a potential disaster. The city is at a crossroads. Her best days do lie ahead, but we need a leader who can take us from point A to point B to the better days. The arts are one of the true international languages. We look to this community to help steady Atlanta, to help sustain Atlanta for generations to come. I've been, like so many Atlantans, a struggling mom, a small business owner, victim of a home invasion, a business executive. I've raised a son here, and I've taken care of sick parents. I am Atlanta. I am not an artist. I'll be the first to admit it. I'm not good at that, but you are, and I'm good at listening. My grandfather used to say, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason, so you could listen twice as much as you talk. So I'm ready, willing, and able to listen to you, to you, those who are the experts in the arts and who are the most talented. I don't plan to just promise. I plan to continue to deliver. I don't plan to just deliberate. I intend to perform. I look forward to serving you, but I need your voice and your vote. The risks are high, the time is now, and the choice is clear. My name is Lisa Borders. I want to be your mayor on a mission. Thank you. Let's close by thanking our candidates for making us feel like we have been the only debate that you all have done. You guys were fabulous. Thank you so much.